Pulse of Life. Excellent. Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's session, Overview of uh, Electro-Optical and Infrared Systems Calculations. My name is Tom Alfetto uh, from Clarify's marketing team, and I will be your moderator today. Uh, before we get started, a few housekeeping uh, mentions. All attendees will be muted, uh, but we encourage you to ask questions, which you can do so by typing in the uh, Q&A uh, portion or the widget at the top right corner. Uh, and we'll answer all questions after the session, which will last about 30 minutes. Uh, today's session will be recorded and available after the event. Um, I'd like to introduce today's speaker. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Jonathan Partee, who has over 25 years of experience developing innovative and award-winning electro-optical systems. Currently the CTO or Chief Techno Technical Officer of Defense and Aerospace for Excelitas Technologies Corporation. He's experienced in all aspects of EO system development from concept to product launch. Uh, Dr. Partee has worked at large defense contractors, small companies, government laboratories, and in academia. He started a company actually while part of the uh, research faculty at Penn State University, uh, and he achieved a three-figure um, uh, compound annual growth rate by the time he sold the company 10 years later. Uh, Dr. Partee has a PhD in physics from Iowa State University. Uh, before we get started, a little background about Clarify. Clarify is the uh, leading independent provider for of AI for unstructured image and video data. Uh, its end-to-end -end computer vision and NLP platform covers the entire AI lifecycle. Clarify has won numerous awards and is recognized by Forrester as a leader in computer vision platforms in line with companies such as Google and Microsoft. Uh, the company was founded in 2013 by our CEO, Matt Zeiler, PhD, after winning the top five places at ImageNet. Clarify continues to grow with 80 employees at our headquarters in New York City and our offices in San Francisco, Washington, D.C., and Tallinn, Estonia. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn the presentation over to, to Dr. Partey. Okay, well, thank you so much, Tom. Unlike most of the folks who are going to be presenting, I am not an expert in artificial intelligence, but I thought it might be useful to give you guys a little bit of an understanding of what goes on in our part of the imaging chain. So we start off when a photon comes from the sun, and once we uh, generate the data and get it to you in a standard format, that's where um, the artificial intelligence side of things begin. Of course, uh, we've been making sensors for a very long time. I'll talk a little bit about some of the sensors that we make that might be of interest to the AI community. Um, we're very interested in working with folks in AI because we do believe that the work that you guys are doing is going to help enable uh, our sensors to demonstrate some capabilities beyond uh, what we can, are currently able to do. So uh, if I can advance the slide here, the way that we will go through this is first uh, look at some very basics, the spectra uh, that we uh, uh, cover. We'll look at a couple of types of cameras, not just our cameras, but a host of systems that are out there that can meet your mission needs. And we'll look at what are some of the key performance parameters that we need to be thinking about when uh, we're building a camera system. I'll do some very top level first order system calculations, kind of the back of the envelopes stuff that you would do as you're beginning to decide what uh, sort of optical capabilities you need. And then I'll give a little overview of our company. And as I say, call out a couple of cameras that you may be interested in as uh, the AI community. Normally, uh, the type of systems that we build are ruggedized for outdoor use and for very long range type of applications. And so um, that's uh, essentially, it gives you a preview. Now, because we are generally an electro optics company, we have the ability and we've seen a lot of very beautiful things. And so here I'm going to show you the most beautiful thing I have ever seen. Now, some of you may be sensitive. I've seen people faint. I've seen people um, have a tear in their eye. And so if you are a sensitive person, please don't look straight onto the screen, at least not initially. Um, give, it, give it a minute or two. So here we go. The most beautiful thing I 
have ever seen. Doesn't that get you just right about here? James Clerk Maxwell's equations. Uh, he put these together somewhere around the 1860s uh, from work that other scientists had done. The top two are simply Gauss's law. The first one talking about um, static charges in the electric field that's generated. The second one showing that there are no magnetic monopoles. When we get to the third one, we see that a changing magnetic field creates an electric field. This is Faraday's law of induction. On the last one, we see that a, um, a, a change in the magnetic field or a change in the electric field time phase was added by uh, Maxwell himself and uh, added to Ampere's law. So all of these together became Maxwell's equations. The amazing thing, especially on a day like today, is that when you take the curl of the curl of those bottom two and you, um, and you uh, work it through, you'll find the equations to the right turn out to be a wave equation where the velocity of the wave is described by mu naught, epsilon naught, which are constants that were measured long before uh, Maxwell came along. If you work out the math, one over the square root of mu naught, epsilon naught, what do you get? The speed of light. This is 21st of October, 2020, as all of you know, is the day of photonics because in 1983, the General Conference of Weights and Measures use the speed of light to determine how long a meter is. So if you can tear yourself away from the beauty of what we see here, uh, we can move on. But essentially what this tells us, what Maxwell's equations tells us is that light is an electromagnetic wave where a changing magnetic field gives us a changing electric field, gives us a changing magnetic field, gives us a changing electric field, on and on, and this is how light can propagate through a vacuum. So at Excelitas, uh, we have developed the expertise of working all the way from the deep UV all the way up through the long wave infrared. Now for artificial intelligence, I think most of you are dealing with visible light over to the long wave infrared. And so this is where our expertise is. We are the eyes, I think, for uh, many, or potentially for many um, systems that use artificial intelligence. Now, our particular systems are using only lenses and mirrors. Uh, we don't use antennas. And we'll talk a lot about how the environment and the atmosphere affects what we're doing. Now, most of our applications use focal plane arrays. These are little squares divided up with lots of little pixels where the light will come in and convert into an electron, and we can read those electrons, give them a digital value, put it in a standard format, and pass that over to you AI folks. In some cases, we're not actually creating an electron, we're actually looking at how um, a particular part of the array heats up, but no matter how we do it, we're able to form an image that we can pass over to you that you can do some analytics on. On the upper right hand side, we see the Planck, Planck black body curve. What this says is that an object at a certain temperature will emit radiation um, into space at a certain uh, power. You can see that the peak of uh, the curve in the visible regime is about 500 degrees Kelvin, which is about what the sun's temperature is. And so maybe it's not so much of a surprise that we have developed um, our vision to be the peak of the sun's black body curve. As the objects get cooler, the amount of power that they radiate becomes less, and you can see the peak is shifting off into the infrared, and this becomes uh, important. Um, Wilhelm Wein, who was a German physicist, discovered a very simple relationship between the black body temperature and the peak wavelength. Lambda, the, temp, the, the wavelength times the temperature is equal to a constant. And so if you apply that equation in the lower right hand side, you can see that in the visible wavelengths, that's where the sun is peaked. 
as you move through the near infrared into the short wave infrared, into the mid wave infrared, you start to see um, things like jet aircraft and exhaust showing up in the mid infrared. And as you go all the way up into the long wave infrared, you see that our body heat um, can be picked up in the long wave. So this gives you an idea of where these various modalities are going to be useful. Okay, so as I said at the beginning, our job starts when a photon hits the top of the atmosphere. It'll propagate down through the atmosphere and hit a target. There will be bands of that light that do get passed through and bands that don't get passed through. So we have to calculate which are getting through and which are not based on the environmental conditions. It'll hit a target. And of course you care about what the target size is, what the reflectivity is, what the contrast is, and whether there's a background clutter around it. So we have to model whether uh, what, what that situation looks like. What is the mission we're trying to accomplish and can we actually see it? That light gets reflected off and goes up to our camera that may be on a UAV. At that point, we have to worry about parameters that are within our control within the camera. Uh, we obviously have to worry about how far the object is away from us, but uh, we can choose things in the camera to be able to make sure that we meet the mission. So things like the pixel size, um, you know, smaller pixels are good for higher resolution, but of course they will collect fewer photons. And so that's a trade space that you have to do. Um, the aperture size, you wanna have the biggest possible aperture you can, but you can't carry a one meter telescope up there. And so you have to do a trade space on that and make sure that you have the right size aperture. Um, also, you want a very fast F number. You want to get as many photons on that focal plane as you can. The field of view is very important. This is, of the scene, the angle that the focal plane is able to see. It's different in the horizontal and in the vertical. You obviously want that to be as large as you can um, within other constraints of the system. There's also a parameter called the instantaneous field of view. This is the field of view of one individual pixel. So you can imagine that the overall field of view is made up of a bunch of uh, IFOs. Um, this will determine you know, how many pixels you will have on your target. Uh, the frame rate is important. Is your target moving quickly? Is it moving slowly? Um, and you know, too fast a frame rate means you're collecting fewer photons. Um, at a given time. This next one is the optical transfer function. This is really important. A lot of hobbyist telescope um, manufacturers will give you this big aperture telescope with great magnification, but the problem is that they don't get all of the photons that come in onto the right spot on the focal plane array. To do that, you have to have the prescription of the optics correct within a fraction of the wavelength of interest. So in the visible regime, you have uh, say 500 nanometer wavelength, your optics have to be accurate within 50 nanometers for you to get a good image. And this is one of the things that makes good optical systems with good imaging capabilities so expensive. Well, once we've got it all the way through the optical system onto the focal plane array, we have to worry about the noise in that focal plane array. Things like shot noise that are generated um, because of the discrete nature of electrons. Things like the discretization noise because we're converting a well of electrons into a number um, and there are discrete levels uh, to those numbers. And also things like dark current and things that are inherent to the design of the focal plane. All of those things need to be taken into account. And finally, the jitter on the platform is important. If you're on an airborne platform and you're shaking your camera larger than a couple of IFOVs within a frame rate, you're going to get a blurry picture and you will undo all of the great work that you did when you were um, building a nice uh, optical system. So if we're lucky and we've done all of this well, we have a good image over to you and it's not really luck, it's technology. We pass the image over to the AI folks. If you are able to do your processing on the platform, that's really great because that means that the bandwidth of what we have to send either up to a satellite or down to a ground station 
can be drastically reduced. And that's one place where AI will play a big role. We don't have to transfer everything um, off the edge. That's a big deal for us because we are moving towards sensors that have uh, more and more pixels and more and more pixels means more and more bandwidth unless you can find a way to reduce that. If we have to put it off raw or compressed, then that image processing and artificial intelligence occurs down on the background. And then the final thing we worry about is what the display resolution looks like and uh, what the observer's capabilities are. So that's kind of the chain that we have to worry about before we're even able to get the data over to you. So some examples of cameras in the reflective regime. The first one we have on the left is a very standard system, what you have in your cell phones, a silicon with uh, chips of different colors on it. The way this works is that the uh, different color chips will let light into the pixels um, of different colors. And the assumption is that the object you're looking at extends over a whole bunch of pixels. And so you interpolate between the pixels to figure out um, what red is doing, what blue is doing, and what green is doing. As I say, you know, there are other ways to do visible cameras, but this is really the most common. Now, silicon that's used in most visible cameras actually has response out to the near infrared. If you go home tonight, you take your cell phone and you point a um, infrared remote at it and you push a button, you should see that blinking light in your cell phone. Uh, companies take advantage of this by taking near infrared LEDs putting them around the outside of a standard visible camera. And so it allows them to see at night because they are illuminating the scene. So that works well, except that in many applications, you don't wanna actually be walking around with a big near infrared spotlight where someone could see you on their cell phone. And so there's a technology that's been available since the 1960s that I still think is really, really cool. They're called image intensifier tubes, and they're the main component of night vision goggles. These things can run all night on a couple of AA batteries, and they can turn very dark starlit night into a scene that looks as bright to you as uh, noon at the OK Corral. These are very long-lived uh, uh, components, and as I said, they're very low power. Really, the only major problem with them is that they're analog. You have to have your eye looking at the back of them. And so it's very difficult to do any image fusion or artificial intelligence on the output of an image tube unless you couple a um, CCD or focal plane array to the back. But again, um, very cheap, uh, relatively cheap uh, compared to some other technologies. They last a long time, very low power. Because you wanna be able to uh, get a digital set of data out of um, these low light systems without illumination, a number of companies are building systems that can do that um, in, in, a, in a sensor. Um, examples would be the American company Intivac and Fairchild and the French company Photonis, all have systems that are pushing the limits of how low they can go. I mean, these systems are taking a single photon and are amplifying it by 50,000 times. So you can imagine um, you know, the, the, how amazing it is when you look at a scene um, using some of these low light uh, systems. Now, just for the fun of it, I thought it would be funny to show a clip from the movie Patriot Games, which uh, came out in the, the mid nineties and unfortunately made me laugh out loud at a part of the movie where it was um, supposed to be very serious. If you remember the movie, Harrison Ford is in the basement with his family and um, people are in the house with night vision equipment. And so I'll start this here. You won't hear any sound, but you'll see the people with night vision equipment coming down the stairs. It looks to me like those are PVS-7 night vision systems. And this is not actually, uh, they actually put a filter and did some speckling it's not exactly what a night vision uh, camera would look like. And here they kick open the door, they're coming down, and here's the plot point that made me laugh out loud. Harrison Ford flips on the lights, they're so blinded that they have to whip off their goggles and um, they, they shoot errantly and, and they're killed. Can you imagine a system where if it gets a too much input light, 
actually blinds you, uh, damages your 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 um, you know your, your vision. That's not exactly how these would work. Uh, what they do is they can limit the amount of electrons um, that uh, are converted, and so it'll go up to a certain level of light and won't go higher. So what would have happened in this particular case, they wouldn't have had to whip off their goggles. What they would have seen is maybe a little bit of blurriness, but other than that, um, there would be no drama whatsoever. So surprisingly enough, Hollywood does not always get the technology right. Okay, the other important modality is uh, an emissive sort of uh, sensing. This is where the body itself is emitting all the radiation that you need to detect on the focal plane. Um, so here we have a tank that's hot. It is emitting light, you know, based on the Planck uh, black body curve out into space. And we're picking that up with our camera. All of the things that we worried about before we have to worry about now. And uh, in addition, I didn't talk about optical losses before, but we have to use a completely different set of material to focus this light down on a focal plane. Uh, before we could use glass, uh, now we have to use things that are not glass because glass itself is not transparent uh, in the infrared. Um, in fact, if you try to look through a window in the mid wave and the long wave, it'll be uh, totally reflective. Everything else is pretty much the same. The huge advantage of mid wave and long wave systems, of course, is that you can see um, during the day and at night. So uh, three major areas of infrared radiation, uh, sometimes divided as I have here. The short wave infrared, so just above um, the near IR from 1.4 to 3 microns is uh, still called reflective infrared. And uh, we're still seeing reflections from the sun um, and from ambient light. And so it's still very intuitive to us how the shortwave infrared works. Um, the pros of this modality is that it gives you the highest diffraction limited resolution in the infrared. Um, there's lots of good applications because high energy laser um, weapon systems work in this uh, regime, work, work around this regime, and telecom works around this regime. And so um, that's where these cameras uh, find their uh, niche. Uh, the cons are is that it's still a fairly expensive technology, although um, I saw some ad cameras advertised today that are looking pretty good. And so the technology uh, is advancing and it still requires ambient light. When we move over to the mid infrared, again, this is the, the infrared that um, is something around where rocket engines and exhaust would be. You see this picture taken with Excelatas' camera looks very, very good. You can see the people on the deck of uh, this boat. I think this was taken at maybe two uh, kilometers away. I forget exactly, but it's on our data sheet. And you can see a lot of the detail of the boat. Um, and again, this camera is going to work a day or night. Very good camera. The only con is that, of course, it's more expensive than the visible cameras, which are relatively cheap. And it will use higher power than other systems because we need to cool that focal plane array to keep the noise down. Um, on the far right side, you see a long wave um, infrared camera. Uh, these have been around for a very long time. I don't know exactly where this picture came, but I do like it. You see a mouse, which of course would have um, high body heat uh, being eaten by a snake, which would be um, more ambient. Uh, these systems, uh, the long wave, uh, are becoming more and more common. Uh, they have uncooled versions of these that are approaching uh, the range performance of some of the cooled versions. And so uh, they're becoming more and more capable. Of course, you have to know what movie I'm going to use to talk about long wave infrared. Um, this is Predator from the mid 80s. Uh, I think most of us saw long wave infrared for the first time um, in this movie. They actually filmed the Predator's view of the movie using an early version of a long wave infrared camera. So here, the Predator looks evidently right at Arnold Schwarzenegger does not see him in his long wave infrared camera. But as he looks around, we see the view of the scene in long wave infrared. And as he pans over, he sees some kind of a small mammal, 
underneath a log and he'll take a shot at it. So it's kind of amazing to me um, that the, uh, the, the key plot twist they used here was that a 225 pound bodybuilder, six foot two, couldn't be seen under a very thin coating of mud and water, but that uh, animal under a you know, 24 inch thick log could be seen. Uh, the temperature ranges that modern day infrared cameras can see are very, very small. Um, 25 uh, millikelvin or um, 25 milladegrees Celsius are easily seen by today's cameras. And so a little bit of mud and water would have made absolutely no difference whatsoever. The predator should have been able to see um, Arnold Schwarzenegger. I do know that soon after this movie was released, a number of folks in the special forces tried this on some of their teammates to see if it would defeat thermal cameras. And uh, they found out in fact, that it does not. Another funny uh, movie, this is from Burn Notice. It's a, it's a TV show, a secret agent TV show. Here you see Michael Weston getting into the car with a thermal imaging camera. We know it's a thermal imaging camera because uh, the actress here calls it a thermal imaging camera. So here he's going to try to look through the windshield of a car. Uh, you can see those lenses look uh, clear and transparent, so it's uh, probably not actually a thermal imaging camera. He's able to look through the walls of the building and find people inside. Um, this might be okay if there was no wall on the building. You might be able to see a scene like this, but through a wall uh, to people who are uh, deep inside, uh, that's certainly not going to happen. And we would certainly see opaque areas um, where the windows were reflecting back to us. Now, the colors we saw in Predator was blue and black um, all the way up to red. And here we also see white and black. The color scheme used in thermal is really not um, all that important. You can make it anything you want. It basically shows how empty the well is to how full the well is, the fuller the well, meaning a higher temperature. You can make that higher temperature black. You can make it white. In this case, uh, they made it white and they went through a color palette um, that kind of looks like iron as it's being heated up. Okay, so we're through all of that. Uh, we kind of have a little idea about the phenomenology of uh, infrared systems and a couple of examples where Hollywood got it wrong. And so these are kind of the key performance parameters that we need to look at. I'm not gonna read through all of these, but I'm going to talk about a couple of them. So you need to know what your mission properties are. Generally, we're talking about extended targets. There are also missions where you really only need to see a, a pixel. So like a missile launch, you don't care if you were able to resolve the missile, you just wanna know if the missile was launched, it's okay if it's a single pixel. So we haven't talked about any of that, we're talking about um, sort of extended targets. So these are the key performance parameters that we use. And to do a back of the envelope calculation to make sure that you um, are in the right ballpark, these are some first order calculations that you can do. So the first thing is to ask um, how large is a point uh, from the object on the focal plane array? And so we can use that by thinking about what the smallest diffraction limited spot would look like. And that's described by this equation, x equals 2.44 lambda, the wavelength of interest, times the f number um, of the camera system. If that spot is about one to two pixels, um, you're in good shape. It can be even a little bigger than that, that's okay. Um, but you're just uh, kind of using pixels um, that are below uh, your diffraction uh, resolution. So once you found that your diffraction limit's about right for the number of pixels, then you go and you calculate your instantaneous field of view. So what is the field of view each pixel is looking at? The equation is two times arc tangent, pixel pitch divided by two times the focal length. That tells you what the angle your pixel is looking at. With the range to the object, you can figure out how many pixels you're going to see of your target at a given range. Once you figured that out, then you use Johnson's criteria. Well, what's Johnson's criteria? Johnson's criteria was an attempt in the 50s by John Johnson from Night Vision Labs to answer the question 
of how many pixels do you need to give a 50% chance of an observer being able to detect an object, to recognize an object, is that a person or is that a tank, and to identify the object, is it a threat to me? Uh, what Johnson found out, um, and actually he did it in line pairs, but what he found out in terms of pixels is that about 1.5 pixels across the critical dimension is enough for us to say that something's there. Six pixels is enough to recognize whether it's a person or a tank, and 12 pixels is enough to identify whether it's a threat. And here you have three pictures that illustrate uh, that concept. Now, normally, if I'm doing a back of the envelope calculation, I want to put some margin on these, um, so I round them up significantly just to make sure I'm in the right um, order of magnitude. Now, finally, one of the hardest things that we have to deal with when we're talking about long range imaging is the atmosphere. Uh, the atmosphere has bands of transmission and bands of absorption, as you can see from this image, this, this graph right here. The atmosphere also radiates energy, which will cut down on the contrast between the target and the background. Uh, there are very elaborate models that are used to predict the transmission and the scattering and the path radiance. Uh, the most famous one is the program ModTran. And so in ModTran, you can set up what your target reflectivity is, a whole bunch of things with that, figure out what the geometry is to your sensor and to the sun, and uh, it will figure out what the spectral radiance is of the scene. Uh, the spectral radiance is given in the units we see here, a flick, which is watts um, per centimeter squared per micron per steradian. Um, what you can do to do back of the envelope calculations, I've done this before, is have some set ModTran um, uh, scenarios that you put in a spreadsheet to kind of uh, map out the um, outside of what uh, your mission set looks like. Um, we also have to deal with atmospheric turbulence. You can see a picture of the moon here where the changes in the index of refraction of the atmosphere is actually making the moon wave with respect to each other. Uh, this is a problem when you're looking at very long ranges and very small IFOBs. Just as a reference value, around 15 to 20 microradians is where um, you would start to see a problem. Of course, that depends on distance. It depends on turbulence. Um, you could easily see a situation where um, the turbulence is 10, 20 times higher than that. A lot of groups are using AI to remove these sort of distortions, and that's something that obviously we are very interested in. All right, so the gold standard are these two programs here. Uh, once you've uh, sort of figured out that you're in the right time zone, you are able to um, use these programs to really do an in-depth analysis. Uh, we at Excelitas have people on staff who are experts in doing this sort of analysis. So if there is a particular mission, we can tell which camera of ours is going to work best um, in that mission setup. So NVIPM from Night Vision Labs and TRM4 from Fraunhofer in Europe, you can actually get these free if you can show that you're doing work um, for the US government or for NATO, uh, you have to fill out some forms and you get them free. Unfortunately, I know at least for NVIPM, I believe you have to have ModTran to um, pull in some of that atmospheric information. And so you may still need to um, get a, a ModTran license. What these things do is they take all the parameters that I've mentioned and more, and they put it into a program and I don't know if you can see my cursor, but down here you have a probability. Uh, the furthest curve out here is detection. The next one in is identification, uh, recognition, and the last one is identification. So it tells you a 50% probability of accomplishing the task um, is, is right along this line. If you want a 70%, then um, that's a closer range. This gives you a really good judgment of how well the optical system is going to be able to accomplish the mission set. Okay, so that's kind of the technical side of the, the presentation, just to give you an overview. Um, just to show who we are um, at Excelitas, we've been around for a very long time. 
Uh, from 1950, we spun out of MIT and became EG&G. Um, further on, we became part of Perkin Elmer. Then Perkin Elmer in 2010 spun out a majority of its electro-optics portfolio as Excelitas. Excelitas then has gone forward and picked up key acquisitions like Key Optic in the UK and Research Electro-Optics here in the US. And we consider ourselves a leader in developing and delivering high performance uh, systems from UV to ultraviolet. And so, um, you know, th this is really who we are. In terms of some of the products uh, that we have, this is our mid-wave infrared camera. Uh, I've been in the industry a long time and I'm sure you'll consider me biased if I say that this is the best package in terms of the size, the weight, and the image clarity that I have ever seen in the industry. Very good price point. It has a 13 and a half times continuous zoom, which means that you can choose a narrow um, field of view and IFOB, so very high resolution, or you can back it out and get a wider resolution or a wider IFOB. So by real time scanning through, you can change the mission sets um, that you're looking for. And I see down here, the cruise liner was at two kilometers um, in that image down below. Uh, anyway, uh, you can see that we have the range performance off to the side that we calculated using uh, the programs that I just showed you. Uh, we can detect a tank at about 40 kilometers. That's a uh, main battle tank is what MBT is. And we can detect a human at just under 20 kilometers using um, this system. We can recognize a human at about five kilometers and identify them at two kilometers. So this is uh, uh, our mid-wave infrared camera. Uh, we don't have any um, uh, artificial intelligence on the back end of it yet, but you can imagine uh, we'd like to partner with people that can help us to develop um, object recognition, object tracking, um, the atmospheric uh, um, turbulence mitigator, all those kind of things. We think that artificial intelligence will play a key role on um, these particular systems. Very good. Thank you, Jonathan. Oh, is it my time up? <laughs> <laughs> no, sir. Oh, okay. But, but we did want to give a few minutes for, for Q&A. Okay, I'm almost done, I promise. Okay. Um, as we look, the, the, uh, we have a long wave infrared camera here. Um, again, uh, we have a 10x optical zoom on this long wave infrared camera. Again, uh, very good camera, very good price point. Our passion is in those optics, so the image quality that you get is very good. Um, detection out to eight kilometers, recognition out to two, and identification out to one. And the last slide, the conclusion, um, we believe that we're a leader in developing high performance photonic innovations to meet the technology requirements of customers worldwide. We have a lot of high TRL projects. Believe me, I have just skimmed the top level of them. Um, if there are any other applications you're looking for, uh, please feel free to write me and let me know. Uh, we are interested in bringing uh, more AI onto our systems, um, getting these systems into the hands of AI developers. And so, um, you know, even though we don't do AI, we're very interested in the capabilities that it can bring. Okay, so that is my conclusion. Um, are there any questions I can answer? Yes, okay, so thank you, Jonathan. Fascinating, I personally learned a lot from this uh, session, so thank you. Uh, so the, the first uh, question that we have is, uh, running AI at the edge requires computing power. What do you think is the most likely solution for scaling AI on top of a camera's live video stream? Yeah, I mean, this is a question that I would have to push back to you guys. This is a, um, not my area of expertise. I understand it takes a lot of power. I think what would have to happen is a collaboration between us and between an AI provider to figure out how we can get low power onto those systems. In fact, it's a huge problem, not only for the camera systems that you saw, but we also make soldier systems um, like the goggles that you saw and we need to get low power processing on it that can do AI things 
um, of consequence. And so uh, this really is the, um, the, the key thing that we need to work with you guys, uh, the AI community on. Very good. Uh, uh, do you design precision agricultural sensors to the require in-scene collaboration targets, uh, i.e.? Uh, we, yeah, yeah, we don't uh, design those in particular. Um, all of our uh, mid-wave and long waves, sometimes they can use scene-based non-uniformity corrections or nukes. Um, and sometimes we actually have a shutter that comes down and does a nuke. Uh, we generally find that doing uh, bringing a shutter down for the nuke um, works really well to kind of uh, recalibrate all those pixels. Great. How about you mentioned AI for atmospheric correction, but I'm wondering if you're using any AI for tasks like noise reduction or resolution enhancement? Uh, that's a great question, Michael. No, we're not doing anything like that um, at the moment. Um, I hadn't really even thought about the possibility that we could do something like that. I think that would be um, that would be awesome. That really would be. As I say, I think AI gives a huge capability to our sensor. Um, we're the eyes, um, and, and you guys can do things with that data that um, are, are phenomenal. Perfect. And with COVID, what types of cameras can be trusted to properly take someone's body temperature to detect a fever? So that's, that's a really good question. Uh, normally, that occurs out in the long wave infrared. And uh, the commercial side of our business is actually making um, the sensors that are in those thermometers. So they're long wave infrared microbolometers that are, are being used to detect people's uh, sensors, uh, detect people's temperature. Perfect. And you said that it takes 12 pixels to identify a threat. How do you identify a threat? Actually? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a tough thing. I know that there are some AI companies who are able to detect a person versus a person holding a rifle. There is a human interpretation of the scene that John Johnson was doing when he was talking about um, how many pixels. And so what he did is he showed people carrying guns and not carrying guns and tried to figure out what it took an operator looking at that to um, figure out whether that was a threat or not. I imagine that AI is as good, if not better, at detecting those sort of threats uh, than the human operator. Perfect. And then, um... What, what industries do you see as having the largest uh, sort of opportunity or spending opportunity for this technology or industries? Well, so for the mid-wave and long-wave, long-range cameras, we see a lot of concerns about um, UAVs, uh, very small um, UAV systems. That's a big industry that we see these cameras selling into and all kinds of surveillance systems. I mean, if you wanna protect infrastructure, um, you want to protect borders. AI actually gives capabilities for us to sell more cameras because we don't have to have one camera per operator anymore or one camera or, or a bunch of cameras on a, a, a bank on the wall. Uh, we can use or, or we can use AI and only present the operator the information that they need. And so AI can actually be um, looking at those camera feeds um, and so we can have a, a much smaller ratio of operators to cameras. Very good. And within these industries, who, who are the peak people that uh, Excel and are talking to? Like who are the decision makers? Who's, who's buying this technology? It's, it's mainly the system engineers, the people who are trying to figure out, okay, this is the mission set that we have to meet. How are we going to do that? And that's the discussion that we have with them. And we say, okay, this is the mission set. This is the technology that you need. Uh, say you need 24 seven, say you wanna detect personnel, say you have a certain price point. Those are the kind of things that, that we work with the system engineers to figure out um, what technology is going to best suit their needs. Very good, okay. And uh, I guess we have time for one more question. Oh, there's one here in the chat box. What did you say your spectral range was again? Okay, so those will be on our data sheets that you see here, but um, the mid-wave camera is uh, three to eight micron range, and the long wave is eight to 15. Um, we sell cameras into both of those um, spectral ranges. Okay, 
And then uh, last but not least, so w when you're talking to these industries, the decision makers, what, what, what specific problems are they trying to solve for? Uh, mainly it's uh, trying to solve for um, people or objects making incursions into areas that they shouldn't be and the need to have 24-7 surveillance of uh, these areas. And so again, this is where AI plays a big role. Um, AI can be watching the camera feeds and uh, alerting people when something out of the ordinary uh, occurs. Perfect. Okay, well, our, we're, we're at the end of our session and uh, I really wanna thank you for this. It's been enlightening. Uh, thanks for answering the questions. And uh, as a final note, we'll um, be sending out uh, th this video uh, shortly. And uh, thanks everyone for attending the session and have a great day. Okay, thank you so much.